Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. For people that get their caffeine in other ways. Uh, but uh, we'll figure it out. Just uh, thank the Lord for what he's doing. Good things are happening. Sunday is my heart is set. Everybody say my heart is set. Come on, say it real loud. Come on, say it like you want them to hear you over at the casino. There you go. Amen. Thank God. Aren't you glad you're investing in the kingdom instead of wasting it over there? Only thing we'll get to take with us is what we've sent on ahead. And uh, thank God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for making sure that uh, this happens because it's so important. Amen? So we're excited about My Heart is Set Sunday coming up this Sunday. Our young people are going to be at Youth uh, Regroup, and we're excited about that. That's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. What was that? different sound than what I anticipated. Thank God. Can I have a great time? I know it. I'm jealous. We'll hold down the fort here. Uh, we're going to have a great time here Sunday. And uh, please bring somebody with you. Amen? Brother Anthony Trimble, you do a good job with the student ministries. And I know this is one of the most... This is one of the most uh, valuable meetings all year, regroup, and uh, it's been such a success. How many years is it now? Five years for regroup. Thank the Lord. Aren't you glad for this church and for all the ministries, all of our directors? Let's give them a hand. All of our directors, <laughs> ministers, thank God. Appreciate each one of you. Amen. All right. It's time for open forum for a couple of minutes here. And here's the question. Put it up there for us. What qualities do you look for in a friend? All right. Yell it out. Stand up if you want. What qualities are you looking for in a friend? Loyalty, I hear. Respect? Did you say respect? <laughs> Money? Money. I don't know if I'd sit near this guy. Money. We need money from a friend. Good food. Friendliness? Yeah. If you have a friend, you got to show yourself friendly. Faithfulness? Very good. Trustworthiness? I heard honesty. Very good, Sister Brittany. Somebody, what is it? Forgiveness. I like that. A sense of humor. Amen. Mutual interests. Good. Somebody else, what do you look for? I don't know. The Cardinals come into it here. A Cubs fan. Here. Let's check out the cheap seats here. Just kidding. Just kidding. What about it? Qualities of a friend. What are you looking for? Like-mindedness? Like That's good. These are great people back here. They just stay where they can take the kids where they need to. I understand that. Uh, what about it? Anybody else in here? I'm trying to make sure all hearts are clear here. Qualities in friendship. Good influence. I like that. That's very good. There are no wrong answers, really. Uh... Interest in what? God? Interest in God? I thought you said golf at first. I was going to say, well, I don't know. That, that limits the pool a little bit, but uh, positive. That's good. Positive. Good influence in somebody that's positive. Don't want to be around somebody that's going to bring you down all the time, huh? What about it? What is it? Mercy and compassion, Sister Lorraine said. That's good. 
So what, what, I heard something else back here? <laughs> Dependability. I like that, Brother Chet. Yeah. Qualities in a friendship. That's good. A lot of good input there. You know, uh, I didn't really know God needed a friend. But, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know, I didn't really understand that a man, a mortal man, could befriend God. Now, I need a friend. I need companionship. I need advice. I need counseling, correction. I need to be cheered up. I need to be comforted from time to time. Sometimes I feel lonely. There are times you feel Despondent, there are times each of us need a friend that'll speak uh, to us with wisdom, with sympathy, with encouragement, with truth. You need somebody in your life that'll tell you the truth. Don't you? I think that's the mark of a true friend. People just tell you what you want to hear. They're not really a friend. The Bible says the wounds of a friend are faithful. Friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. And faithful are the wounds of such a friend. There is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, right? I think that means family. There's a friend that's closer than family. Iron sharpens iron, so does a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. Everybody needs a friend, but surely not God. And yet, it's written in more than one scripture that Almighty God endeavored to get a true friend in Abraham, and he got one. You realize that That's not said about any other individual in the world, in history, in the Bible. One man, Abraham, was the friend of God. Well, I think it'd be good to find out why. (laughs) If we're studying people of faith, it'd be a good idea to figure out what character and what characteristics that Abraham had and what what was it about Abraham that made him a friend of God? Because I think we'd do well to emulate that. Amen? Amen? How many of you would like to be a friend of God? I mean, really. I mean, I I, I don't know. I, I think sometimes we want God to be a friend to us. But have you ever been around a friend that just wanted to talk about what they wanted to talk about? Is that what prayer is a lot of times? For God? But I jump ahead of myself. (laughs) You know, something interesting happens in the book of Genesis. Um, I don't, because Abraham takes such a, a big portion of Genesis. I don't have the diagram like I did last week. But beginning at chapter 12, just prior to chapter 12, it's amazing. The Bible kind of uh, takes a decided turn in its focus on historical events and, and world history kind of fades into the background of the biblical narratives. And only occasionally are, are events of global importance recorded. But for the most part, the focus centers on the lives of certain key individuals and their families. And the first one is Abraham. Abraham. Interesting, the contrast. Think about this. We studied about Noah last week. And Noah is a contrast to the world who is washed away in the flood of judgment. And Noah stands as a new beginning after that. Same thing with Abraham. 
the thing that precedes Abraham in the book of Genesis is the Tower of Babel where they don't learn their lesson yet. And some scholars believe they built the tower to avoid a future flood. Man, that had to be fun for God. (laughs) If there's one day, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. It would have been that morning when they wake up to try to continue this deal and all of a sudden there's a multiplicity of dialects and languages and people are talking Korean and people are talking Chinese and people are talking Spanish and people, and they're all looking at each other going, now that would be funny to me. I mean, you got to admit God has a sense of humor, right? And so after the dispersion, Abraham is set as a contrast to this Tower of Babel incident, just as Noah was to the previous flood. And although there hasn't been a flood of judgment, there there is a new beginning in Abraham. I think about Abraham and uh, there's, there's a lot there. There's so much there that I, I just don't know. It was such a challenge to study about Abraham. Wow. There's a, there's a lot there. I won't do it justice, but I'm going to try. Uh, his, his faithfulness, it reminded me today, Sister Trimble, of John Bryan. I remember being in John Bryan's car. He had a Park Avenue that was... Uh, relatively new. I don't know that much about cars, but it seemed like a newer car. And I remember riding in that car with him one time. I was probably a little younger than you are, maybe Ryan's age, uh, 25. uh, I think that's how old you are. Um, (laughs) I was in my mid-20s in... uh, I was sitting in that car and a young evangelist was in the front seat with Pastor Brian and, and uh, he looked around. He was kind of in a pseudo-covetous way. You know, kind of shining that dashboard. Oh, man, this is, this is a fine car, Brother Brian. God's been really, really good. God's been good to Brother Brian. God has been good to John Brian. He's making a big scene. and Brother Brian, I'll never forget, he just looked over at at him and said, that is correct, and John Brian's been good to God, too. That idiot wasn't with him when he was out in the middle of Papua New Guinea starting to work in the jungle. He wouldn't have went there. (laughs) Where the grandfathers were cannibals and he started an apostolic work with Chief Tukumba out there. Had seven wives and had to figure out how to tell him he had to get rid of six of them. He did. A young evangelist thought all this started today. No, 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 no. John Bryan had been good to God. That faithfulness, you know, nothing to be ashamed of there. As important as Abraham is in Genesis we know surprisingly little about his first 75 years. We, we meet him at 75 years old, basically. He's introduced as a leading character kind of suddenly, Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, he's Abram until Genesis 17, where his name's changed to the more familiar Abraham. I preach a message called, Who Put the Ha in Abraham? Because there's a lot of laughter associated with 
some of the things in his life. The Bible's less concerned with the history of Abram than with his obedient response to God's claim on his life. Abram was a successful and wealthy person, but one area of his life was filled with pain and unfulfilled dreams. And as God often does, he dealt with Abraham at the point of his pain. Right. Issue was Abram's childlessness and the unique problems it presented in that ancient culture. From the beginning of the story, God's word to Abram was clear. He was going to make Abram's family grow into a great nation that, we, that would become a blessing for all of the world, for all of humankind. And the call of Abraham contained two great promises that were very important to ancient man, and that was land and descendants. Very important. Tremper Longman said Abraham's life in particular focuses on his wavering faith towards God's ability to fulfill his promises. Let's look at a couple of highlights and, and uh, we'll move on. Abraham's story occupies more than a fourth of the book of Genesis. That's significant seeing we have, you know, a chapter on creation. He's, he runs from chapter 11 to chapter 25. Dies at the age of 175 years old. I found it interesting when I, when I looked at this that Abraham lived in the 22nd century B.C. So that would make him about as far from the birth of Christ as we are in the other direction. 2200 compared to 2014. Abraham lived during a time when the great Akkad Empire in Mesopotamia was coming to an end. Political power in both Canaan and Egypt were fragmented. We first meet him at Ur, in Ur of the Chaldeans, a major city occupied by the Babylonians, also called Chaldeans. Acts 7 2, this is uh, Stephen's testimony, but he mentions Abraham. He said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of, of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. God appeared to him. Now, I, there's no way to do all this justice, but I'm going to try to narrow it down to five uh, areas. Number one, the call. Number two, the challenge. Number two, or three, the concern of Abraham. Number four, the courage and the consistency of Abraham. Hebrews 11, love Hebrews 11, don't you? Amen. Hall of faith. It mentions Abram or Abraham and he, it, it takes several verses, you know. <laughs> Moses just gets a couple, Abraham gets quite a few. He gets a fourth of the book of Genesis. He gets, uh, what, eight, nine verses in Hebrews 11. It's, this guy is, he's worth looking at. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which had found, has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who had promised." Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore, echoing the promises made to Abraham. Don't you love the continuity between the Old and the New Testament? These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. I wonder how much we are at home here. They traveled as strangers and pilgrims. 
For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now that reminds you of something else, doesn't it? Of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able. You see something in Hebrews you don't see in Genesis. It's not told in that story, but Hebrews uh, clues us in. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. The faith of Abraham. Now, now I got to tell you, Abraham was not perfect. Abraham made a lot of mistakes. He was the father of the faithful, but listen, there was times when he didn't act just right and react correctly, right? Let's, let's focus on the call first. Faith brings us out. Uh, chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Now, he not only calls us, uh, faith doesn't just bring us out, but faith brings us in. You look at the next few verses, verse 6, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites uh, were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built what? You see Abraham building altars to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he did what? He built an altar to the Lord, and he did what else? He called on the name of the Lord. That's significant. That's significant. There's a New Testament parallel to all that, right? Right? People that call on the name of the Lord. Faith doesn't only bring us out. Faith doesn't just bring us in, but faith brings us on. Verse 9, so Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Now, let's uh, go forward to uh, the challenge that he faced. He was childless, and God promised him, verse uh, one of chapter 15, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Now, if God came and spoke that to you, what would your response be? Ryman, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Brianna, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Would it be, thank you, God, I worship you? That is not what Abram said. <laughs> he was a complaining friend this day. <laughs> Have you ever had a complaining friend? Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. I love this verse in the Bible. Then he brought him outside. Because what I think of is that Abram's living in his house that he built and God brings him out to his house that he built. He literally brought him outside. 
and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed, everybody say he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. You must have faith to receive any promise from God. You must have, tell somebody next to you, you gotta have faith. Abram is saying, come on, you know, it's getting late. And God brings him outside, has him on this futile exercise, count the stars. What point did he stop? 1,062, 1,063, God. I've been out here a while. 1,064. Okay, you're going to have as many descendants. I like to think when he said the sand of the seashore, the stars in the heaven, that the sand was being more connected to earth, was his earthly uh, progeny and the stars were you and I, his spiritual descendants. And he believed the Lord. Everybody say he believed the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. So I'm going to give you the land and I'm going to give you the descendants. I'm going to make all of this happen. And he believed the Lord. He believed the Lord. If you want to be a friend of God, you must have faith. Yes. Amen. Even in the face of impossibility. Amen. Amen. Now, before we get to the child, we have to deal with the concern that Abraham had. Now, Abraham's nephew was with him. And, and you, you understand, you remember the story how uh, the, the town, Sodom and Gomorrah, was attacked and they were carried away and Abraham got his men together, 300 and something men, and went and challenged the people that had taken them away and, and uh, won the battle, came home. That's when the whole thing with Melchizedek happened and he paid tithes and it started way back then. And, uh, and then... Uh, <clears throat> And then God, being a friend of Abraham, says, I can't hold back from him what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, man, I'm telling you, you'd think people would learn after the flood, after the Tower of Babel. But here's Sodom and Gomorrah that are uh, uh, in, in such a desperate state of debauchery. Uh, it, it sounds like the days of Noah again concentrated in one city. I don't know if anybody was in Boston in the 70s. Anybody ever go to Boston in the 70s? New York will su suffice as well. New York in the 70s was horrible. But I remember being in Boston in the 70s and they had a combat zone. And uh, when I asked about it, they said, well, they try to uh, concentrate all the crime, all the, all the killing, all of the drugs, everything in a certain amount of city miles here or square and you could go they the pastor drove us through there about one two in the morning and it looked like it was noon people all over the place crawling with people and uh it, it was a crazy crazy place nobody stopped at the stop signs or lights and i i, I just you know you wanted to you want to stay in your car but uh it was, it was a, a, a crazy, uh, terrible place. And uh, Sodom and Gomorrah was worse than that. And so you see this situation where Abraham is not just concerned about himself, but he's concerned about his nephew. And God says, I'm going to destroy this place. But Abraham begins to talk to God about someone else. 
And he begins with 50. Would you destroy the righteous with the unrighteous if you find 50 righteous people there? And God, having this conversation with his friend, says, no, I won't destroy him for 50 people. Think about, we thought about eight people last week that were in the world. What about finding a city with just 50 people that were righteous? He doesn't stop there. Well, what about 45? Would you save it if 45 righteous people were there? What about 30? What about 20? What about verse 32 in in chapter 18? He said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. 10 people that are righteous. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10 people. Would to God we would intercede for this city like Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Would to God somebody, you and I would get it on our heart to say, Lord, don't destroy this city because we got a work to do. We've got a work to do. Don't destroy this city. Don't let it be too late for this city because we give us a little bit more time. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned in peace. Just 10 people. Would you save it for 10 people? And there wasn't, as you know, 10 righteous people. That tells me a lot about the effectiveness of Lot. I don't want to be that ineffective in this city in our lives. How many of you feel like me, you'd like to win a soul this year to the Lord? Would you pray about something other than your own concerns and say, Lord, help me reach out and not just be concerned about myself. Help me reach out and take another soul on my heart. How many of you would think about who that is? And, and pray a prayer for them. Let's stop and pray right now. Lord Jesus, God, help us to reach out into this city. This isn't just about us having our needs met. This isn't just about us and our lifestyles and our, our jobs and our families, God, but it's about lost souls. I thank you for the example of Abraham that looked beyond his own home, Lord, and said there are people that need me to pray and stand in the gap for them. Help us be that kind of person that you would hear and listen to, Lord, as we pray for others. He was concerned. He had courage. Can you give God what you love most? Genesis 22, then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac. Interesting that he left Ishmael out. (laughs) Didn't count. Now, that was something. I mean, I'm jumping ahead to when he's alive, but that was something that they had a child while he's 100 and his wife is 90. You believe what you want. I didn't read this in a book, but this is what I believe. I believe God restored the youth of Sarah because he had to lie about her twice. I don't know many 90-year-old women you got to lie about. You know, he was afraid that the king was going to invite her, you know, and kill him to have his wife. Now, it wasn't right that he lied. I want to establish that. I'm just wondering why he had to lie. I mean, if you got a 90-year-old wife that looks like a, a supermodel... And the king's got his choice of everybody in the land. God did an amazing work on Sarah. Am I right? I 
I mean, I love Sister McGavick, but I don't know if anybody would have had to tell any lies to get through the city. And so God gives them this miracle child. Ishmael's the wrong choice. There's a lesson that I don't have time to go into about rushing God's purpose and not having faith in God. There are points in this story where you realize this faithful man has no faith. There are points in this story where he wavers and he's an unway. You know, the lesson in the end is that God understands the unbelief occasionally, but you have to bounce back and put your faith back in the Almighty and say, you know what? I got enough self respect to say, I'm sorry because I doubt it. But I'm coming back to you, and I'm going to trust in you. I repent for my mistakes. I repent for the moment of doubt, and let's get back on track. I know you know what's best. So they have this promised son, and then in verse 20, or chapter 22, God says, take your only son whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Is there anybody but me that finds that preposterous? Miracle child, 100 years old when you had him, and now I want you to kill him. You know, there are people in this place, God gave you your job, but if he asked for it back, am I right? God gave you your family. But if he asked for it back, God did miraculous things. We have to be careful that we don't worship the gift more than the giver. That car you drive, that house you live in, that job you have, don't let it come between you and God. That position you got in your company, it can be gone tomorrow. How are you going to be when it's going and when it's coming? God said, I want it back. Are you willing? Or is this all about what you can get out of this? Verse 9, they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I don't see anywhere else where there's a parallel to Calvary like there is there. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. Obedience brings blessing. Why do you think I'm apostolic today? Why do you think I still preach in the face of opposition? 
that women ought to look like women and men ought to look like men and we still ought to have separation and we still ought to have apostolic faith in this church and not be like every other. I'll tell you why. Because I want the blessing of God on our church and I want the blessing of God on our life and blessing follows obedience. The thing you love the most, are you willing to be obedient to God and say, that doesn't mean more than you do, God. That doesn't mean more than you do. You can tell. You can tell from your checkbook. You can tell from your calendar. You have obeyed my voice. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram, offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Thank God for the substitutionary death. The consistency of Abraham. You say, well, he wasn't very consistent. Well, he kept getting back up and responded with faith in the end of every situation. It didn't mean he didn't make mistakes, but he consistently came down on the right side. Your direction is so much more important than this moment. If you fall, let me talk to somebody maybe hasn't known the Lord all that long. If you fall, do not stay where you are. Just fall in the direction of the cross. Remember that he is faith. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Do not stay down. Do not turn around. Get up and go toward Jesus Christ. He is ready to receive. He is ready. If you will be obedient to him and come back to him, he is ready. Hebrews 11, 8. Faithful Abraham, New King James has the heading. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Let's finish up with this. Three issues of faith for Abraham. Number one, would he believe a land would be given to him? Would he believe a land would be given him? Number two, number two would he believe an heir would be born? These are issues of faith that Abraham had to deal with. And number three, would he believe that God can provide beyond the testing that he faced? You really going to give me the land you promised me? Are you really going to give me the son you promised me? Are you really going to work this out even though it seems impossible right now? Any one of those points, Abraham could have failed. But he kept the faith. Let's talk about us. Number one, God's called each of us out of this world like he did Abraham. Are you following his call? Are you being faithful to what God's called you out of? Are you still flirting with all that stuff? I'm not asking if you know the words to the courses on the screen. I'm asking what, what it looks like when nobody's around. I'm asking about, are you a faithful person at work? Are you a faithful person in your social media? Are you a faithful person, are you doing the right thing and according to the call that God's placed on your life? He's called all of us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Are you acting that out in faith? Number two, we each have challenges. Are we gonna trust God during the tests? My goodness, I... I, I I'm trying to finish up here. I returned a phone call from 
Toronto. You heard me mention Brother Desmond McKenzie, uh, maybe in prayer. Made the phone call. I won't go into it in detail, but he said something very shortly in passing as we talked. He said, I'm sorry, uh, Pastor Trimble. I, I, it's taken me a couple of days to get back with you. I know I called you last week and you returned my call, but Friday I was in meetings all day and I had some chemo and, and I, I was, and so we, we talked about the business we had to talk about and uh, the, the, the connection, whatever. And we talked about 20 minutes or so and I went back to the chemo. I said, I noticed you said in passing, Something about chemo. What's the situation? Well, I have bone marrow cancer that's malignant and told me about how the plasma uh, replicates and makes the bones explode from inside, basically. And uh, the Holy Ghost swept into my office. And we began to pray. And Jesus showed up right there, man. Just an encouraging, we were praying in tongues over the phone. I don't know Desmond McKenzie very well. I, I don't know if I'd know him if he walked in this room. I've met him a couple of times. But the Lord knew. And I said, you know what? It was kind of a false start. We, we didn't uh, end up, I'm not going to Toronto, although he wants me to come at some point. This date didn't work out. And so uh, I said, maybe this whole thing was just about this prayer. The Holy Ghost met with us. But are you going to, when, I mean, he said, I've been through the radiation, I'm in the chemo, I have stem cell in April, but the stem cell is only supposed to give me two, three years. Incurable, but God is able. How are you going to face the challenges and the tests in life? How are we going to, are we going to trust God in the middle of anybody facing any challenges? The rest of you, I'm glad you're doing well. Praise God. Each of us have family, friends, and acquaintances. Will we intercede for them? Like Abraham interceded for Lot? He saved Lot's life. Hands down. No Abraham. Lot's burning. The angels that went to get Lot and his family and grabbed them by the hand said it was because of Abraham. Abraham's prayers got him out of that city. Who could be lost because we didn't pray the prayer? I'm just saying, I think we're concerned about ourselves a little more than we are other people. And that needs to change. We got a whole city of two million people out here and we need to get them in this church. They need to hear the truth. They need to hear, I'm gonna keep preaching it until I see it. Amen. Number four, in the end, what will be the word that describes our walk with God? Will it be faithful like it was for Abraham? What's that word going to be? Are we going to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I believe it will. There are people in this building, the Lord's going to say, you were faithful. May have other words. You were, you were caring. You were a light. What word is going to describe our walk with God in the end? And finally, how can we be a better friend to God? Are we just a complaining friend? Are we just one that comes with our laundry list and says, hey, God, A, B, C, D, E. Wonder what his day's been like. Somebody said, usually it's 80% all about us and 20% about him. Maybe we need to reverse it Amen. in our prayer, right? <clears throat> Let's stand together. Let's talk about what to do tomorrow. Number one, if you want to jot this down and do it, it's a good idea. List the areas of your life where you're challenged and list how you can react in faith. 
to these challenges. Just put it down. And number two, well, let me just make sure you understand that. Whatever area you feel challenged in, write it down and think about how you can react in faith in that situation, just like Abraham did. Number two, list family and friends you want to see rescued and intercede to God for them. Intercede to God for them. <clears throat> God knows somebody needs your prayer. And finally, in your prayer, be as concerned about God's feelings and needs as your own. That's a true friend. I didn't know he needed a friend. But you know, I'll post these on the website if you didn't get it. I'll post those things about what you can do, those last two slides. But you think about the play. You, 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 Easter play is coming up. But <clears throat> you know, after Jesus prays this horrific prayer and, and, and sweats as it was great drops of blood, the Bible says, Nobody's there for him, basically. Everybody's sleeping. But the angels come and minister to him. Wonder if Abraham would have been there. Would he have been somebody that showed up and prayed all the way through? Friend of God. I don't know. but I know God wants to be a friend. Do you want a relationship with God like that? Let's come and close in prayer together. Ask the Lord to help us in Jesus' name. God, I want to be a friend that you can count on, Lord. <clears throat> I want to be a friend that you can count on, Lord. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. <clears throat> Would you reach out to that friend right now? In the name of Jesus. 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 on him.